Welcome to Mysterious Goings On. I am your host, J. Alexander Greenwood. Please call me Alex. It's just such a mouthful to say J. Alexander Greenwood. That's what she said. Hey, been a while, hasn't it? Maybe it hasn't been a while. If you've been binge listening, this is just another one in a series you've been listening to. I think we're right around episode 26 or so. Mysterious Goings On is a podcast by, for, and with independent writers in particular, genre in particular of the particulars. And I dabble in the mystery, thriller, suspense, horror genres. I am the author of the John Pilot Mystery Series, Five Books and Counting, and I will have an update on my latest book here in just a minute. If you are a longtime listener of the show, you will probably want to hear just a few updates on this, that, and the other, but before I get to those updates and some thoughts, I want to let you know we have a special guest, returning guest, a returning champion to the show, and that is thriller, suspense, and horror author Jason McIntyre, um, probably one of not probably definitely one of the best in the genres aforementioned writing today and we are excited to have Jason back on the show frequent guest good friend of the show good friend in person or good friend in real life and we're looking forward to talking to Jason a little bit about what he's up to and just having a little bit of a chit chat well let's address the elephant in the room shall we we're talking in November November 23rd the day before the United States celebrates Thanksgiving to be exact and it has been roughly three weeks since the United States um, took a massive dump on the world and elected Donald Trump president. Um, so, by the way, if you're a uh, conservative uh, Trump-supporting listener, I imagine you're turning this thing off right about now. And if you're not, well, I applaud you for hearing me out. There are several uh, adjectives to describe uh, what I think America has done, disastrous being one, um, uh, mistake being another, um, suicide being another, but you know, maybe I'm being a little too strong. No, I don't think I am. I think that anytime a country elects, a democratic country elects a sociopathic son of a bitch with delusions of dictatorship, boldening racist elements, I think that we're in trouble as a world and as a country, and I'm very concerned about that. I will talk more about that in a future episode. I'm certainly opinionated, but this is different than, oh, my candidate lost, somebody I don't like won. To me, this is an existential crisis for the United States and perhaps the world. We have elected a dangerously unprepared, unfocused, incurious, and frankly nasty man as president, and it concerns me a lot. So if you're still with me, I'm sure my guest Jason will be thrilled with this lead-in. We'll get into our conversation with Jason in just a moment, but I promise you this, I will do this for you. I will label an episode where I talk primarily about the political and other issues of the day coming up in a future podcast. In the spirit of Thanksgiving, I want to tone down my rhetoric for now and just promise you that I will give you some fire and brimstone about the Trump election in the days and weeks to come. I would like very much for the holiday season to be peaceful, but uh, there's not a lot of indication in the, with the news since the election that it's going to be. It's going to be a rough four years, folks. Again, this podcast is primarily, even though we do like to talk about issues of the day, it's primarily about writing. It's primarily about storytelling, and that's what we're going to talk about. So, I'm, uh, I'm going to give you a quick update on a couple of things, and then we're going to we're going to bring in Mr. Mr. McIntyre, or J Mac as I call him. All right. First things first. Uh, I'm working on the sixth book in the John Pilot mystery series, and I will tell you the title if you haven't heard. It's Pilot's Rose, and I had uh, promised this book for a Halloween 2016 release. And you know, as John Lennon famously said, and I've quoted a million times, life's what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. Things got busy. Things got hectic. Got hairy with my day job. Got hairy with some other stuff. And I also, I think, kind of lost the thread on the book for a while there. It just, uh, as Stephen King said, I, I let it go too long and it got a little stale. But the good news is, with some encouragement from people like Jason, by the way, and others, I have got back on that horse and um, am really starting to crank out the bones of this story and putting some meat on some of the bones, too. I also had said that I would try to get it out prior to Christmas so it could be a good Christmas gift, but that's probably not going to happen either. But here's what I think is the silver lining on all that. 
let's say I put it out in January. I mean, January is going to suck for a lot of reasons. One, you got your post-holiday letdown. Two, the weather is going to be absolutely gross, right? Generally, most of you, unless you're down in the southern hemisphere and then it's summer and it's going to be great, right? Um, but if you're not, if you're in the northern hemisphere, it's going to suck. Three, uh, Donald Trump is going to be inaugurated. So there's going to be a lot of stuff that's going to really be depressing and not interesting and you're going to, you're going to need an escape. So that's why I think January is a great time to release Pilot's Rose. That's my logic. It's also a massive rationalization for me not getting the book done. <laughs> See what I did there? That's what I did. Okay, so about the podcast. I'm going to try to podcast at least twice a month. Love to get back to a weekly deal. It just really depends. I've got so much going on with my company during the day. I have a lot going on. Um, hiring new people. We're doing some new stuff. Very, very busy. I know a lot of people manage to work a day job and still write novels, but I suffer from a lack of bandwidth mentally after a full day usually a 10, 11, 12 hour day of dealing with my company. I just don't have a lot left, a lot of gas left in the tank to, uh, to write, but I'm going to work on that as well. So that's what that's going on with the podcast and with the writing. We'll see what we can do on both of those counts to keep you in the loop and keep you entertained. Love to hear what you think. I'm on the Twitter at a underscore Greenwood. Don't forget we are on Facebook. Just search John Pilot and that's P I L A T E mysteries on Facebook, and like the page, and comment. I'd love it if you do that. Other thing I'd like to tell you is uh, pilotscross.com, P-I-L-A-T-E-S, cross.com, is the Mothership website where our blog is hosted. Also, autographed merchandise is for sale directly there. If you would like an autographed paperback copy of one of the first four books in the series, the fifth book is a book of short stories, an NC book only, so I can't obviously autograph that unless you mail me your Kindle, and then I'll be happy to use a Sharpie on that and mail it back to you. Um, but otherwise, go to pilotscross.com. I actually uh, sent two out this week, uh, autograph books, people wanting from Christmas. So you could just uh, get on there, and there's a space where you, if you buy the books and they're on sale, uh, and you can tell me when you buy them how to make it out. Like, you know, Alex, uh, make it out to uh, Jessica and say, F you, Jessica, this is a better book than anything um, James Patterson's written. Ha ha. You, it's really not, but I just thought I'd say that. But I could do that, or I could just autograph it, autograph it straight up and send it to you that way. It's whatever you'd like. And again, that's Pilot's Cross, Pilot's Key, Pilot's Ghost, or Pilot's Blood. Any of those paperbacks can be yours, autographed and personalized, and sent to you if you do it. Let's see, today's the 23rd of November. If you get your orders in, I'd say no later than December 15th. Now, if you do it before December 15th, I could send it pretty cheap, uh, you know, media mail or first class mail, pretty cheap. After the 15th, you're going to have to pay a little more um, in postage if you want to guarantee it gets to you before Christmas. And if you're not in the United States, basically, if you want it before Christmas, I'm going to need that order no later, no later than probably around the 5th of December, maybe 6th, right around there. Uh, after that, there's just simply no guarantee. Sorry. Um, yeah, your mileage may vary, not for use with all Hot Wheels cars. Okay, sorry, Tennessee. Now, let me think here. Have I, got, have I covered all these bases? I think I have. And I think what would be appropriate now is if I were to... Um, wait, what's that? There's somebody at the door. Hang on, just let me answer. It's cold out here. Let me in. Jason McIntyre, get in out of the cold. Hey, happy Thanksgiving. Hey, thanks. Hey, you, you've already had Thanksgiving, right? Yes, sir. We had it about a month ago. Hmm. Yeah, we have it. We celebrate earlier. Um, in your neck of the woods, yes. And let me ask you a question. Do you, uh, do, you, uh, do you pretty well partake of the same kind of meal as Americans, or do you have a, a variation of uh, that's your own? Or the traditional, the traditional thing here is very similar. It's a turkey dinner with you know all the fixings and that kind of thing. So yeah, very similar. Mm, yes. Do you make your own? Do I personally? I. You know what? I've never cooked a turkey. Have you ever stuffed it? Yes, I've helped with the stuffing, yeah. I didn't mean yeah. the turkey. Okay. You know, <laughs> as you were as you were going on a, a little bit, <laughs> see how I changed the subject there? I was thinking about your, your, your challenges with the work and with family life and with also getting in the writing time. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking... The next book should probably be something along the lines of like Pilot's Coffee or <laughs> Pilot's Red Bull, something like that. Just to, Pilot's just Amphetamine. Be, Pilot's Amphetamine. Yeah, there you go. Pilot's Meth. 
<laughs> well, I, you know, that's funny coming from you because you have just completed. Can I say this? I'm going to say it. We'll cut it out if I can. You just completed the final book in your critically acclaimed Dovetail Cove series. Is that correct? I, yeah, I finished the first draft of the of the last book. So there, as you know, as as most indie writers and most writers in general would know, there's still a lot left to do. There's a lot of editing process and that kind of thing. But the first draft is is in the can. Yes. And could I just say that, um, as, and I, as a consumer of, and that sounds so awful, consumer, but as a uh, loyal reader of the series, I'm working on the series. As you, you know, I, I just recently finished uh dread oh oh, oh. oh my god um of the series <laughs> wow um and um the would it be fair to say that the dovetail cove series jason was that i mean they're typically what 70 to 100,000 words tops each is it right or am i wrong there's a mix there's okay so there's 10 10 books yeah and about half of them are between thirty and forty thousand words, okay. which would be an eighty to a hundred page printed book. Right. And then the other roughly half, four of them are, like you said, about seventy, eighty thousand words. And then the final book, the tenth one, which I finished uh, recently, the first draft of, uh, it's pushing two hundred thousand. So all told, uh, this the series or the collection or whatever you want to call it, the the word count on that is is over 600,000 and it, that's yeah and I never really set out to do that and uh, halfway through and two-thirds of the way through and here at the end I'm realizing how crazy that was to, to <laughs> undertake that it was, not, it was not my intention to be that insane um, but I'm I'm really happy with where it went so I guess as I recuperate here um, I'm feeling good about it yeah and that final book is called what again Dude, I'm not telling the title yet. You can't. I, I was really trying to trip you up. I was like, hoping you'd be like, oh, it's, um, yeah, it's Ed. For listeners who don't, the, for listeners who don't know the gimmick, um, I, I don't even know where I came up with this, but there's a rhyming scheme of all the titles. There are usually one or two word titles for each of the ten books, and they all rhyme. So the first one that I put out was called Shed. And then the second one was Bled. And then we have Dread and we have Zed. And each time a new book comes out, it's kind of a secret. And we do a little contest and, and see if somebody can guess what the name of the next book is. Yeah. And people are convinced that the, they're gonna be, the next one's going to be Fred or Ted. Uh, there's all kinds of hilarious guesses. And I've read uh, Dread and Zed. And Zed, by the way, is also excellent. And i try trying to think which my next one will be. Um... I guess Bled will be my next one. I think that's the one well, I'm going to... Right? Yeah. Okay. Considering how, how down everybody seems to be, and, and you in particular with your, your opening monologue about the state of American politics, mm -hmm. I don't know if you should read Bled right away. It's a bit of a downer. Well, okay. What what should I read? Uh, wait. Uh, Shed? Sure. Yes. All right. I'll read Shed. I'll okay. do that. But not... Awesome. Okay. And... But I'm better, you know. I'm I'm getting better, buddy. I'm getting better. Really proud, of Led. It's just it's just a little bit heavy for you right now. I think I think I think you you need to maybe just take a step back from a few heavier things at the moment. I, I'm getting better though. I'm telling you. Yeah, I, I know. I'm I'm teasing. No, but but I appreciate the heads up because I did finish. You, I okay. Here's the deal. I went to Boston and I left the morning of the election. I pre I pre voted. I absentee voted everybody. So don't anybody give me any shit about. My vote. I voted, but I was on the plane to. It was a straight flight to Boston, and I finished oh three fourths of uh, uh, dread. Excuse me. I finished three fourths of dread on the flight up, and then I had to put it down because we got up getting off the plane. And then I had the conference, and I didn't read during the conference because I was busy working, drinking, occasionally sleeping, that kind of thing. But then I got back to it when I got on the plane after the election and results were known. And then I finished it, and, I was, and it, don't get me wrong, folks, it's good, it's really good, but man, it's got a tough ending, and and I, I and I, I mean, when I say a tough ending, I mean like, I don't mean it's bad, I don't mean it's like, oh, you don't want to read this ever, I don't mean it like that, I just mean like, this is like masterful, the way this book is done, and I had such strong, deep feelings for it, that, that I think were magnified 
um, due to my sense of utter loss and hopelessness because of the election. So, yeah, I appreciate the heads up on that, Jason. That's important to me. Well, thanks for saying so about uh, about the book. Um, I was I think I said this to you. I was really glad you were sealed in an airplane as some of those uh, all started coming in because I. You know they don't let anybody move around on the plane, and I was I was glad that you you didn't have the opportunity to maybe put a boot through a window or something. And oh, nah, I no. And 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 end end things for anybody because it was you know I know that it was dire for for you and a lot of people. And it it's going to get worse, but that's not what we're talking about. But I appreciate that. Um, so uh, Jason, I wanted to. Uh, before we go on, though, because we've probably piqued some interest here, where do we find these books? You should you should tell where are Dovetail Co. books to be found. The standard places, Amazon is uh, one of the most popular, of course. The iTunes bookstore um, and Barnes and Noble Nook, the, that store as well, and Smashwords and any of the other online Kobo? retail. Kobo. That's correct. Yeah, Kobo as well. I just neglected to mention, um, and they're they're all in ebook format. Um, Zed, you could probably still find paperback copies. I have one of Zed, the, the first edition. I've just now put out second edition, so it's now available again after a a period of not being available. So it's now available again with a all the- with a new cover. Yes, with a new cover. Now, what's up with that? Well, I. I've been a graphic designer for close to 17 years, wow. uh, as well as my kind of my day work, which has been communications, public relations, um, and and uh, alongside content writing and that kind of thing. But I've I've always loved doing the graphic design, so I've I've been at it at a professional level for 17 years. And so I, when I started publishing my own books and my own short stories, uh, it just seemed natural that I would do my own cover art. And, and book jacket design and the interior layout and that kind of thing. And I just, I got a lot of attention for it. I got a lot of, especially early on, I got a lot of attention for it. I, I don't think there was book jackets that looked quite like mine mm. uh, at that time, especially in the indie world. A lot of, five, six years ago, a lot of indie books, the quality of the jacket design, I don't know if you agree, Alex, just wasn't great. I agree. Five or so I think I think indie authors are catching up and realizing that you have to kind of sell the whole package, not just. I mean, you can have a great book, you can have great writing, but if it doesn't look great on a shelf or on the web, um, readers are liable to pass it by. That's probably but, what's wrong with my books. No, I, I disagree. I think you have fantastic. <laughs> I did, well, I'm just joking because I just my sales aren't great. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well. That's another topic, too. I mean, indie book sales have just really plummeted over the last two and a half years. Um, but I got I got some attention, and I got a lot of requests from other indie authors. Can you design me a book jacket? And I simply just didn't have time. And this kind of harkens back to Pilot's Caffeine and Pilot's Red Bull. And, right. And the idea of the balance between life, uh, family, work, and this really, really passionate thing that we do, which is writing and storytelling. Um, and I just didn't have time to, to help out as many. I've done a few. I've done a handful of really good friends' book jackets. Mm-hmm. But now uh, I'm embarking on a period where I have a better opportunity to provide book jackets and design services for indie authors. So if there's anybody out there that wants to check out what I've done, have a look at my book covers. I'm also going to be sharing online um, lots of lots of other jackets that you might not know I designed. Because I wasn't really taking credit for it in the early days, just simply because I didn't want an influx of requests that I had had to then turn down and say, no, I'm, I'm really sorry, I don't have time. Um, so, But now I do have some time, and I, I have the inclination, and I'm putting out some book jackets for some author friends. And uh, yeah, if, if anybody wants to, to look at that, I'm happy to discuss it. Um, I'll just say this. I've worked with three... Okay, I have... You know, I have I have seven seven books and two and two short stories out there right now. And out of my out of that, I did the covers for three of them. And there uh, there's two short stories and my nonfiction book, uh, Kickstarter Success Secrets. Um, and they're all pretty lousy. Now, I had professionals do the cover. My first three were done by a a art professor here in in Kansas City. He did a fine job. They're a little artsy-fartsy and not real commercial. 
but they're but they're but they're cool and they're distinctive. Then I uh, at, at your urging, by the way, I went to uh, Scarlet Ruger's for my fourth book, uh, uh, Pilot's Blood, and uh, she did a fantastic job, a really nice job, really nice job. Um, Sales were pretty good. I'm, they weren't as great as I had hoped the cover would you know, lead to, but they were pretty good. But I think it's like you said, sales have been down the past couple of years for indies anyway. Um, mm-hmm. Then my book of short stories, that was totally going to be like, um, I, I just told myself, this is going to be a down, what I call down and dirty. And that's where, you know, I, I had an editor. I paid an editor, but I was like, I'm not paying for a cover. I'll do this myself. This is like a... It was more like a love letter to the fans who were really, really into my series and to myself in a way because I was just like, this is going to please me and nobody else. So I did a little cover, and it was not that great. But I like Pilot 7 cover, oh, by the way. Well, thank you. And it was so simple. It's just, it's just basic. It's, it's, it's the kind of, best. Wow, thanks. And, and I hate to interject, but I will just say, one of the great things about Pilot 7's cover is the simplicity of it, but it also alludes to the fact that it's a more literary uh, set of stories. And I know that some people, that word literary might turn them off, but I mean it in the best possible way. Uh, and and, I, I, and I'm liking cover, it. The jacket actually really reflects that, in my opinion. It's got that nice um, linen-y yeah. feel like, to it, which kind of brings things to a new level, I thought, for Pilot. Yeah, well, thank you. Wow, thank you. you bet. Yeah, well, but then... Uh, Pilots Rose is coming up, and um, I'll just embarrass Jason. I reached out to Jason, and I had actually asked you before, and that's why you politely said, "I'm you're a nice guy, and you're a friend, but you're, I'm too busy for you. And, I I, 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 you didn't say it that way. You said, it, I'm just really busy. And you were. You were. I think, is that maybe why I suggested Scarlet? It's absolutely why. You, yeah. You, you, it wasn't personal. It was like you were. You had your day job. You had a lot going on. You're just like, I, I don't have time to do it, do it justice. And, Please try Scarlet. She's good. And so I did. Um, but then this time rolled around, and I got real lucky. And the cover's done, folks. I'm excited to tell you. And I'm so tempted to show it with this particular podcast as a cover reveal episode. But I think I'm going to wait, and I'll tell you why. Because uh, I don't I don't want the cover reveal to be t- tainted too much by my political rantings and my uh, being upset. Uh-oh. So I'm gonna. What I'm gonna do is we're gonna save that for uh, Facebook, and we'll do a cover reveal then. But I just want to say this: I J, I commissioned Jason. He did some concepts for me, and I've shown it to a very tight circle of people, and their jaws dropped. I, in fact, I showed it to a friend who's a very dear friend of mine on my way out to Boston on the plane. He doesn't read my books. He's um, don't get me wrong. He's a wonderful guy. Um, He's just not into fiction at all, and he's very busy, and he sleeps like three hours in a day, and so he just doesn't have time to read it. But he supports me very, very much in my work. And I just said, "Hey, you want to see something?" And I, I have my laptop open, and I, and I, and I, you know, he's sitting all across the aisle on the plane, and I just move it over, and I watched his eyes get big, and he goes, "Wow!" He said, "That just sucks you right in." I'm like, "Yeah," and it, and here's the thing, it's simple in a lot of ways, but. It's layered, and their color, and their textures, and I mean, I, I don't want to put a lot of pressure on it, but I, I'm really counting on this cover to kind of help pull this book in for, for people. I think it's going to be that good of a cover. That is so nice of you to say. I can't wait for people to see it, because honestly, when I worked at it, once I hit on the the final version that I showed to you, mm-hmm. it, it, and this hardly ever happens to me when I'm designing anything uh, of of importance, I I stumbled across what I felt was a very very strong cover really early. So after only a few hours of working at it, I <laughs> I had something that I wanted to show you, and I never want to show a client anything that I've designed or worked on until it's like really really close. Right. It was really really close after about I think three and a half hours or something like that. And usually a book jacket, especially something that I'm really passionate about. Um, like a book jacket, um, usually it's, I'm on 12 or 13 or 14 iterations of a design. And I think I was on the second, maybe, I version. know, I know. And frankly, can I be honest with you for a second? Can I interrupt you? You, yeah, were yeah. So, you were so quick to send one over. I was almost, before I opened it, you sent something to me. And I was like, almost disappointed because I thought, Oh shit! He just kind of rattled something off, didn't he? You know, I, I mean, honestly, I'm being candid because you sent it within hours, right, or a day or so, 
or something? Yeah, I did. I did. And you know what? I even thought of that. <laughs> and I waited. I waited <laughs> two hours to send it. You did I really not. did. Because yeah. I'm like, there's, it, it doesn't make any sense that I would be this happy with something that I did. And I'm really, really hard on myself, both right. with my writing I know. and with design stuff. I'm really, really critical. So I couldn't believe it either, to be honest. But I did. It's hilarious. I waited a couple hours before I sent it. <laughs> and we're such good friends. I was just like, I, I can't believe my buddy here would, you know, just kind of blow me off and just, you know, crank some shit out, you know. And so then I opened it and I went, oh. And and then and I think I had one lame note for you and you tried it, but it it, it was and, and it's funny by the way. I showed my buddy Mike the, the, on the plane. I showed him. I said, "Okay, now look at this version that I suggested." And he goes, "No, no, the other one. That's the one." <laughs> and I showed my wife, and she goes, "No, that that's." She goes, "Why do you? Why would you lard it up with something extra? You don't need that, you know." <laughs> everybody, everybody said. I was so disappointed for a bit there because I was like, "Come on, somebody see it my way." See this? Look, I mean, I'm not even going to say what the design element was, but Jason, you know exactly what it was. Cause you I did. do, and honestly, I spent more time trying to work in that I one know, I know. than I did on the whole design. I made you earn your money, <laughs> and I was I was frustrated. I'm like, I don't really think this is the right way to go, but I. But I need to try because he really wants it, and it just it didn't. It made it, it worse. But, but 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 to be fair, I mean, yep. I mean, I was an easy client compared to a lot. Come on, some of these people. Oh, I you know. were. Here's the thing. I'll just I'll just take my turn interrupting because that's what we do. That's what we but, do. Uh, we're so excited to talk to each other. By the way, this is not like being rude. We just get excited talking exactly, to each other. Exactly. Okay. No, oh. I never take it as being rude at all. Right. Um, but the thing is. One of the reasons I think that I came so quickly to the final design is that you had a very clear idea of what you wanted. And in that regard, you were a dream client because a lot of um, writers have a very nebulous idea. They know what their book is about and they've written, a, you know, hopefully a good book, but they have they don't have a real clear idea of how to sell it with that one image, you know, and I just I apologize, but I snapped my finger because that's really what you want is you want this one clear, clean crisp image and that's why we use the word simple it needs to be simple but it's really complicated to get to that simple thing but you already had that done you you did the heavy lifting before i even started designing well that's the thing too is i really yeah i i know what i want and i know what the most dramatic scene <coughs> excuse me in the book is and i sent you the rough very rough draft of that scene just yeah. to give you a feel and yep. there's something as an aside I am watching. Um, are you? An, I don't know if you're an Amazon Prime member, but um, I'm not. Okay, right. well, you know, Amazon creates their own TV shows and stuff now. And if you're right. on Am Amazon Prime, you can you can watch them as part of Prime, or you can. If you're not Prime, I don't. I guess you can rent them if you're not part of Prime. There's who a, has time to watch television, man? Well, I really don't. But that's what I love about Prime. It's like when I do have a few spare moments and I need yeah. to veg out. I mean, to me, it's either it's either watching the Kansas City Chiefs. Or it's occasionally pulling a show. or two. Like, the only regular show on TV I watch right now is The Walking Dead, and I'm about done with it. And that's the story for later. Uh, as we, we have to discuss that, yeah. Maybe we can talk. Yeah, let's talk about it before we go. All right. But anyway, so there's this show. It's new on Amazon Prime with Billy Bob Thornton, who, dumb name, great actor. Uh, you, may, you may recall his turn as Lauren Malvo in the television show Fargo a couple of years ago. He was so good. Uh, <laughs> he, but he, there's a show called Goliath. And he plays this dissolute, down on his heels, former brilliant attorney who's alcoholic and trying to. He's like living in a shabby hotel. It's it's kind of a cliched setup, but and if it was anybody else but him playing the character, it might not work, but it works. And it's created by David E. Kelly, who created a lot of great TV back in the '90s and early aughts. Uh, he did Ally McBeal and uh, I think The Practice and. Uh, what was the other one? Uh, Boston Legal, stuff like that. But this is Boston, not, Boston, yeah. yeah, Boston, yeah. And this is much darker, though. It's not like funny, haha. I mean, it's amusing. It's so good and rich. But anyway, this is what's funny. This is why I'm mentioning it. Besides the fact that I think it's good writing and I'm enjoying it, which I find it so rare that I can watch something on television and enjoy it these days. Uh, but there, the whole uh, center of the story involves. What is going to? What is on the cover of this book? Ah, the the whole key, the whole crux, the whole whole enchilada is. And I, mind you, I just started watching the show three days ago, and I'm just like, oh, okay, I'll watch this. 
you know, bad Santa's in it, haha. And there it was, and I mean, Jason, seriously? Mm-hmm. I should screen grab it and just text it to you later, buddy, just so you can see. I should, I'm gonna, um, so you can see what I'm talking about. But uh, anyway, so if you're a fan of Goliath, then you've got a good idea what's on the cover of my next book. Um, yeah. I, I like that foreshadowing. Yes. Do you find that frustrating when you're watching or reading? Yeah, yes. <laughs> watching watching a show, watching yes. a movie, or reading something, or you hear something, or even a news item. Yeah. And, and it's they they didn't steal it from you, obviously, but it's just so coincidentally similar. Yeah. That you're just like, oh come on! I didn't even have a chance to put mine out yet, or I just put mine out, and that's the same thing. What? What yep. are the chances? It's happened to me two or three times. Uh, sure. You know, and it's you know. It's it's just the way it goes, but in a way that's good because I think that's also an indication that you are psychically tuned into the the the, yeah. the, the grand river of content yep. or whatever the hell you want to call it. Yeah, you know, on the bleeding edge of, of what's what's happening. Yeah, yeah. Although frankly, I, I I I have read a lot of your stuff and I do not see many parallels. You are truly original with what you're there. Doing. Oh, thank you. There are still. Five more books in Dovetail Cove and two other unreleased books in my pipe. And I will say that at least a dozen things, like significant things in those stories have either happened on the news in the time that since I drafted them or have been on popular television shows, movies. And each time it happens, I... I, 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 I hear what you're saying and I agree with you. It's it's gratifying in one sense because you are tuned into this bigger thing and it, that's clear. But it's also like, oh, really? Come on. <laughs> no, I, I, I totally get that. Um, yeah, it, it's a double-edged deal. Um, and real quick, besides Dovetail Co., of course, there's other books that you've written that are not part of that series. On the Gathering Storm comes to mind. Was that And that was your first big hit. That was like one of the first... Uh, that was the very that was the very first novel that I released. But, but yeah. wasn't it also acclaimed by Kendall for some reason? Am I right, or am I thinking of a different work by you? Um, On the Gathering Storm was voted uh, top twenty debut authors by Goodreads. Is that maybe what you're thinking? I think that might be what I'm thinking. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, top the twenty Nightwalk debut Man is a short novella. Mm-hmm. Is, that's maybe what you're thinking of. It it was um, a number one bestseller. The Nightwalk Men, in case people didn't hear On that. Amazon for Kindle, yeah. Uh, yeah, you've had a little bit of a claim there, um, my friend. And I guess, not to be outdone, I, I'd like to announce something real quickly on the show. Um, Please. But, uh, I, I may be jumping the gun a little bit, uh, but I don't care. Uh, it, <laughs> I don't think they'll mind that much. Um, you, you, you uh, fans of the uh, the John Pilot series mine, might, uh, might know that... Uh, John, uh, Pilots Cross, Pilots Key, Pilots uh, Ghost, and Pilots Blood have all been named either notable books, page turners, or top 100 notable books. Actually, it's top 100 notable books by Shelf Unbound Literary Magazine. Um, and I mean, that's immensely gratifying to me because Shelf Unbound has received numerous awards as a magazine for being a quality literary magazine. And I'm just proud that out of literally thousands of submissions uh, those books made this made the cut and i just received an email from the publisher of the magazine the other day that pilot seven my book of short stories has been named a top 100 notable book thank you yeah. thank you thank you thank you very much you may find it at amazon.com or uh smash words it's there or on all the other places um so i not you know well, well, well deserved. Thank you, and I'm I'm I should encourage my friend here, uh, Jason, to start entering shelf unbound competitions because you might actually not be a notable book. You might actually win one. Damn it! So get yourself entered into these things, man. Well, I will take that under advisement. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, indie indie writers. If you're listening, of course you're listening. Or that's a stupid thing to say. You are listening, or whatever. Indie writers, you can't don't underestimate the the value and the credibility that comes from winning or coming in at least as an honorable mention in a prestigious uh, publication uh, contest. I am not one to enter in every little contest that comes. I mean, I've, let's see, one of my short stories won the Writing Room Award for Best Short Story, and then I won the Wattpad 
um, Shelf Unbound uh, Best Short Story Award for in 20, 2010 or 2011 for Obsidian, my short story, which was a real boost for my career um, in getting me readers for my novels. And then having each of these novels in the series to at least be named, a, you know, a runner-up, basically, a 100, top 100 book, it's, it's quite a thing to hang your hat on when you're trying to get into a bookstore or trying to get a library to carry your stuff or just trying to get readers to to take a chance and read um if you look at amazon generally on every book you'll see you know name day top whatever uh, won this award um it if if anybody thinks it's craven or silly sorry you don't know marketing uh readers want quality and they want the they want that third party uh um affirmation that they are buying a book that's worth a damn wouldn't you agree jason Absolutely, and, and it's a good thing that you mentioned that because I think we we as indie authors with the aforementioned day jobs and family lives and children and homes to upkeep and all of these other things that are pulling at our time, one of the first things to fall away is marketing, and a, and a piece of marketing is these kinds of third-party affirmations because you're right. Readers want somebody else to tell them that something is good. It's, it's an extension of word of mouth, but it has more power. It has more power than just a buddy telling you this is a good book. When you see that something has won an award, that is very, very key in enticing a reader who may not give you the time of day otherwise as a, as a writer. Um, so I think that's, that should be a component to indie writers and their marketing. I really do. It, it has to be. Um, and getting reviews is another part of that too. I mean, I know we hammer this over and over, but if you like a writer's work, if you – even you don't even have even if you don't love it, but if you like it enough to to if you would tell somebody on a bus if you were reading the book, yeah, and they say how's that book, and you thought, yeah, it's pretty good, you ought to read it. Why not take literally two minutes on Amazon or wherever you bought the book and go online and leave a starred review and just say three stars, four stars. I thought On the Gathering Storm was a hell of a debut novel. Really loved it. Can't wait to read more Jason McIntyre's work. Check it out yourself. You won't regret it. That takes two minutes to do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think too, Alex, is that I think readers get confused. They don't have to love a book mm -mm. To, to give it a review. And the review helps um, regardless of whether it's a five-star or something lower. I mean, Man, uh, I've said this before. I'll say it again. I would take a three-star review. I'll take sure. it. A four-star. Sure. I, I would rather a thoughtful three-star review came out than just a five-star going, it was really good. You know, some people do that and they think, oh, I want to please the author because yeah, I know yeah. them. You know, And I'm like, yeah. no, don't do that. And then I, I have, I've had some people say, don't tell me how to review. If I, if I want to give you five stars, I will. I'm like, okay, 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 fine. But yeah, sure. I'm sorry to interrupt. Go I, ahead. No, and, and I just wanted to point out before I forget, because that's how my old brain works now, is um, – <laughs> You might not think that a that an indie author or a new author's book is a five star. Maybe it's not. But guess what? If that author doesn't get enough starred reviews somewhere, they're either going to throw in the towel or they're not going to have the opportunity to keep writing. And guess what? Every author, every single writer gets better and better and better. So if you want to work your way towards, uh, you know, a J. Alexander Greenwood book, a Jason McIntyre book, or any other author's five star book, and you don't think they're there yet, guess what? Reviewing them is going to help them get there. Even even if it's not the review itself, even if you don't give them you know feedback and and that kind of thing that helps them improve, just the fact of them getting enough uh, reviews is going to keep them going. It really down. will, absolutely. And they'll have they'll have a five star book out in three years or in five years, depending on their growth as a writer. Which reminds me, um, if you're still listening, I've got a little little thing that might tempt you to do this. I'm holding in my hot little hands. A copy of Pilot's Blood, uh, Ghost, excuse me, my third novel. And, um, oh my gosh, on the back, there is a blurb. Here, I'll, I'll read the blurb. Quote, Greenwood offers a fresh take on the mystery thriller with his John Pilot series. His novels are populated with flawed and neurotic, yet instantly likable characters who find themselves thrown into maddeningly entertaining situations. Greenwood writes fun, accessible fiction that leaves readers asking for more. Jason McIntyre, author of On the Gathering Storm and Thalo Blue, wrote that. Hey. Wow. I am so grown. So, here's Sounds the deal. Sounds like you like that book. <laughs> well, here's the thing. If you're listening to this podcast and you go to Amazon.com and leave a starred review, preferably three or better, for any of my books, 
screen grab that, screenshot your review, and email me at team, T-E-A-M, at alexgpr.com. That's team at alexgpr.com. Screen, just do a screenshot of your review, email it to me. The first person who does that, and I mean, till the end of time, just first person who does that gets an autographed copy of Pilot's Ghost directly from me. I will send it anywhere in the world. Just send me your address. So what you'll need to do, screen grab it, subject line put um, my Amazon review, then attach your screen grab, then I need your name and how you want the book uh, personalized or you know, if you just want my uh, autograph, or if you don't want an autograph at all, that's fine. But if you want it personalized, tell me what message, or if it's going to be a gift, whatever. Just tell me who, what to write, and then give me your address, and I will send it to you. So again, pretty easy. You want to win a, a free copy of the book? I would like just I'm, I'm asking you for a review. So screen grab that review, mail it to team at alexgpr.com, subject line, my Amazon review, name, address, and inscription. Am I eligible to take part in this? Because I can do this. <laughs> I can do this within the next ten minutes. So beat me to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Once the once the podcast launches, I guess yeah, you're you're eligible. But <laughs> I think you've already reviewed most of my books. But anyway, um, I hope I hope you'll, I hope you'll think about doing that. In fact. That's something we might try to do if if it works. We might start doing this every episode until I run out. I've got a supply of books here that uh, um, I do. I have an extra supply on hand. I usually do print on demand, but for the holidays, I always have some extras laying around. So um, for the next few shows, we might be doing this. But again, your chance to win Pilot's Ghost. Um, by the way, a top 100 notable book by Shelf Unbound magazine. It's published by Caroline Street Press in 2012. Uh, it's got a really dark cover um kind of really moody spooky it's i think the writing in it's pretty muscular and mature for me it gets better as you know it's my third book it, as jason said i think i've improved with each book and um it's a book that actually was a kickstarter too. the uh, paperback version um we did 106 percent of our kickstarter goal to raise funds to um uh, uh, to print the book, and so I'm very proud of it. It's a big success in a lot of ways, and I'd love to share it with you. The uh, so that's that. So there's your chance, and I, I'll put I'll put the information in the show notes as well, just to let you know, so you don't have to if you're driving or something, you can just always look back later on what to do. Um, hey, you know what I'll tell you, Jason? You know one thing you said that is true. Sales have been well, one thing. Hey, well, only one. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's you're, fair. Yeah, right. Sales have been down, but guess what? I got my royalty statement from, you know, I have two books on audible.com. Okay. I have Pilot's Ghost, my first, or Pilot's Cross, my first book, read by the wonderful John Edmondson. Um, he narrated it. And I have also um, Kickstarter Success Secrets, which is the story of how I uh, crowdsour or crowdfunded Pilot's Ghost. And it's read by Rye Taylor. And it's a short uh, audiobook. But anyway, I got the largest um, royalty check I've ever had. From Audible this past nice. this past month, so nice. uh, you know uh, through ACX, uh, if you ha if you can read them or you have a good reader and a quality recording, um, you can get your books out there on Audible. And you know I advise you indie authors to check out ACX, which is part of Amazon, and it's all tied together. And if you want to offer audio versions, I mean, yeah, you have to have a quality recording. There are some rules on how you do it. Um, Jason and I both like to read our own work. I know that. Um, John did a great job on my first book, although I am kind of a ham, so I'm kind of, and you, if you've listened to the show, you know I like to read my own work, so I'm kind of thinking, you know, it's always like, when I have time, of doing my own and adding the rest of the series to it, but I don't know, Jason, have you thought about uh, doing uh, the audiobook stuff? I did, um, I, I did an audiobook of On the Gathering Storm with uh, an excellent and renowned uh, reader named Jeffrey Kafer, and so that's available on audible.com and all of the other places that audiobooks are available and it was actually quite a big success um early on and I, I i don't know if this is the case but i feel like i was one of the first indie authors at least in my circle oh i know you would be yeah to do an audiobook and yeah. it, it was a it was at quite the high level at that time um so this is about six years ago and i was really pleased with it and it it did really well for about 18 months and then of course it, it kind of sinks off the new charts or whatever the new listings right um, i did i did my own reading of the night walk men and so that's available for free at 
www.thefarthestreaches.com. You can find that there. And that was my own reading. And also, I should mention that I was a bit of a ham as well when I did it, but it was a lot of fun. I would do it again in a heartbeat, but I also like having the interpretation of another reader yeah. doing, doing the, the book. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm that way too. I think I would very much like to read Pilot's Key. I've read sections of it for this podcast. I'd like to read that whole book myself. I just have a lot of affection for that book. Um, but I think it would be great to have someone else. I'd like a woman actually to read mine. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. I, ha- I have somebody in mind. She's really talented, a voiceover uh, artist. Um, just got to see if she's you know can act the parts as well as read. You know, because I, I you got to be able to act it a little bit too, in my opinion, not just read it. Yeah, I th- I think so. There's a there's a fine line though between doing a doing a stage production on yeah on the audio book and doing a just a really good clear reading with the characters differentiated. That's I yeah. like I yeah. like the latter a bit better personally. But well, when I say acting, I just mean I want some inflection. I want yeah, yeah. you got to be able to tell, like you said, differentiate and convey that proper sense of uh, suspense and drama, etc. There's a really good reading of a book by Whitley Strieber called uh, Majestic that uh, Chris Sarandon, who you may remember from Fright Night as the Vampire, he played, uh, he read it, and he did a really nice job. That's one that sticks out in my mind. And um, I love uh, I love all the Gore Vidal uh, American series that finishes with, I'm looking at it right now, as a matter of fact, uh, The Golden Age is the last novel, and Catherine Walker reads it. She does a fantastic job, and at the very end, Gore Vidal reads the last bit of it, and it's it's uh, the late, great Gore Vidal, my favorite author of all time. And anyway, so uh, indie authors, check out ACX. It's Audible's uh, and Amazon's arm for uh, recording, and anybody can do it. The barrier for entry is rather low. You just have to have a quality recording. Don't be slapping on any music you don't own. That's one thing. Um, yep. Make sure you read up on all that stuff and um, check it out. You know, the technology is its readily available. The, the technology to do a good quality audio recording is, is within reach for almost everybody, I think, now. Um, if you have a computer that you're able to type out your manuscript on, you probably have or can get software on that computer that can help you do a recording of your work that would suit ACX's uh, rules and regs. Right. And, you know, for three years ago, even, I was talking to a recording studio uh, about it. And, you know, it was going to be six, seven, eight hundred bucks to do it. But it would have been engineered to perfection. It would have been perfect. Yeah. But I never yeah. would, I never would have made that money back. And it would take years to make that money back. And I just didn't do it. Then I, then I nearly had a client who has a great studio. Of course, he's one of those people that you have these great meetings with, and then they go dark on you. They just ghost you. You just like, what, I don't know what I did wrong, but I don't hear from him ever again. He was going to trade out some PR work for recording, but I think he was kind of religious, and I think he looked into the books. And I think that's my supposition. Is that he went, oh, <laughs> he decided. Oh. To do. It's funny because Ry Taylor, who read uh, my my Kickstarter book, uh, Kickstarter Success Secrets, it was so funny. I I auditioned him and hired him through ACX, and then it's so funny. After he accepted the job, he says, just by the way, if there's any language or anything that I think is in opposition to my religious views, I, I can't do this. And I'm like, dude, maybe you ought to say that before, <laughs> you know, people, uh, uh, you audition. You know, you should put that maybe in your bio. But it was fine because it was a nonfiction book and, and there's no language. But I, sorry, Rye, if I'm, I don't mean to make fun of you, but you might want to change that, buddy. Um, okay. We're running, gosh. Uh-oh, there's the cops. Can you hear him? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're coming for they're, us. They're coming for you, I think. They heard, well, you know, Benito Trump heard what I said earlier. And uh, so they're going to haul me away, buddy. Um, before I go to Gitmo, though, The Walking Dead, have you been keeping up with that? I, I'm i almost up to date. I think I'm maybe behind one one or two episodes, but uh, I'm definitely on this season. Okay, well, uh, well let me just real quick do, with, do the yeah. obnoxious spoiler alert, spoiler alert thing. I'm not, I, there's, I'm not, okay, that's so obnoxious. If you've not watched this uh, latest series, um, which is this season seven, I think. Or season seven. I think I'm on episode two of season seven. I think are they on three or four? Yeah. If you've not watched yeah. that yet, then you need to turn off the podcast um, until like about the last two minutes or so and, and then go back there. Um, but if you turn it off now because you haven't seen it, great. Just remember the contest and check the show notes and remember to visit me on the web and all the usual places and all that. Check the show notes. Okay, The Walking Dead. Um, 
your take on the direction the show has gone, please. Oh, sorry, I tuned out. I didn't want any spoilers. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I think even as a even as a guy, as a writer who who tells bleak, sometimes bleak stories, I think there's a lot of hope in what I write. So so my feeling with this Negan storyline mm-hmm. is I'm hopeful that they inject some bits of hope and i think they tried to do that with the episode two which Mm -hmm. immediately followed the big gigantic uh uh, season premiere but i'm not feeling that hope i'm not feeling like there there is it feels too bleak which to me it must be quite bleak because i i've written some bleak stuff you wrote you wrote dread for god's sake i did and i wrote bled which you you should check out but Maybe not this year. And <laughs> so for me to say that, say that, that a, um, a fictional universe has gone too bleak, I would say that's pretty serious. What about you? What do you think? Well, I'll just relate this to you real quick. You know, um, and folks, if you're hearing a little bit of a noise under me, it's cold in my office. I just turned on the fan. I'm sorry. It's not a fancy heater. I had to. All right. Um, I'll try not to. If it's really distracting, I'm sorry. Um that's funny because as the author of Pilots Goes, which is a very dark book, I got a lot of criticism. Well, as much criticism as I get, I got criticism for uh, Pilots Goes because it's it's dark and there's it it doesn't end necessarily on a everything's happy kind of note. Um, yeah, I, I'm not seeing the the hope there. I mean, I found myself um, okay after I got over the gore fest of the season opener. Which I knew, yep. I knew something like that was coming. I didn't know how far they'd take it, and I did guess right on who I knew it was going to be Abraham. I was surprised. I thought, well, uh, Stephen Yun, such a popular actor, and the character so popular, they're going to save Glenn. So I was shocked when Glenn got his eye popped out. That was horrible, horrible, horrible. Yeah, uh, even aside from the bleak nature of it, just the graphic nature of yeah. it. I was surprised at that, that just they went that far. Disgusting. To be honest. Yeah. Well, and, and, <clears throat> and like the other night I was watching, watching it and it's not getting much brighter. You're right. And I told my wife, I said, you know, this is just too much for me now. And she's like, what do you mean? I said, you know, with everything that's going on with this country and this, this, this phenomenon and the ugliness that's out there. And, uh, I'm like I'm seeing Walking Dead as being probably an unintentional, yeah, parallel to what's going on, and and I mean, I would like to believe that the an apocalypse would be more like Stephen King's The Stand, where there where the good win over evil, mm-hmm. but I'm more likely to believe than ever that actually, in whatever apocalypse, whatever apocalypse means, it's the other way around, and I'm not getting much hope out of this. I think Jeffrey Dean Morgan is. A great actor. I think he's incredibly charismatic. Andrew Lincoln as well. And amazing. Yeah. And when you think of all the British actors that are on this show who master some pretty decent American accents, it's great. But um, I'm the bleak. I mean, and then I, I find myself too, and I'm watching, and I'm I'm, gonna, I'm 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 on time with it. I you're behind by about one episode, but uh, I find myself going. I just hope there is a freaking, you know, unit of the United States Army or Marines that is okay and they are going to just show up and clean house, which is totally stupid and it won't work. It's not part of the story. But, it, but I find myself hoping against hope that there's some white knight that will come in and save Rick and the gang and take right. Negan and kick him in the freaking balls and just, you know, with that bat of his, you know. But mm-hmm. it, so, so I know, but then as a storyteller, I'm fully aware of a couple of things. One, uh, if they end up killing off or completely subsuming Rick and his people into this evil group, well, then there is no reason to continue watching. Or two, um, and two, I think that they are they are going to pull us as an audience all the way to the edge as far as they can go. They're going to kill more people. They're going to hurt everybody. They're going to humiliate people like they continue to do. Um, Negan's going to get more and more powerful and his people are going to get worse and worse and you're just going to hate them so very much that finally, finally when the day comes, when somebody finally gets over on these bastards, it's going to be this climax of all climaxes emotionally and it'll be a great payoff. I think that's what they're shooting for. Whether the audience has the stamina or the patience to stick with it is another question. 
I completely agree. I, I think that they've probably gone as far as they need to. And I think going further now, all this being said, they've produced or, or are in the process of producing this season. So it doesn't really matter what the audience thinks at this point. Right. Season seven is pretty well in the can. I'm sure they're, they're doing effects and they're doing editing and they're doing sound and all those things, but they've shot it. They've written it. They've shot it. So for me to sit here and, and say they've gone too far to the dark side and they, they could do that big payoff now that you mentioned, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter what, what I think. Mm-hmm. It's going to go the way that it's going to go. But I believe they've actually gone as far as they need to. And I think going further is one of the main reasons I haven't really been chomping at the bit to keep watching. Because I feel like, I feel like they've gone too far over to the dark side, to be honest. I'm good for a few more episodes. Um, I mean, I'm an episode ahead of you, and I'm going to tell you not to give it away, but it, it continues to get worse. Um, I'm going to give it a little while longer, but you know, I as I get older, especially in, in just like you, when the limits of my time are so yeah. great, um, yeah. it's funny because like shows like I, I, I watched The Blacklist for the first couple of seasons because I love James Spader, but then it just became repetitive and stupid, and I was just like, uh, no. And my wife's just like, you're really done with it? I'm like, yeah, I'm done. Um, I just stopped watching it. And that's not like me. Usually when I like something, but anything that's repetitive, anything that's so obviously trying to manipulate me using a variety yeah. of tools, I, I, think that's yeah. a, I think that's a hazard writers have anyway as we generally can see around corners when it comes to a lot of it, especially with television. Because even yeah. good television, the writing ain't always that great. Um, and... Like, my wife used to hate watching TV with me all the time back when we really watched a lot more TV, like back when our kid was a lot younger. And, you know, you're kind of, kind of, you're kind of stuck watching a lot of TV when your kids are really young because, you know, there's so much going on where you just have to kind of watch them and you can't really do a lot. And I would just sit there and go, well, this is going to happen next and this is going to happen next. And I was right like eight times out of ten. And she's just like, it is no fun watching TV with you, you know. And I'm, mm-hmm. So. And that's what I think. That's what I think about the first episode of the walking dead this season was the manipulation bothered me yeah that just the just the um just the way they told that story with the time jumping yeah um and the manipulation of you of the lead up to that episode i thought was kind of cheap and i didn't think it relied on good writing and that bothered me well yeah it's like uh, it's like you know my other fallback and my good friend michael zuffa who has been on the show uh to talk about star trek it's like it's like star trek into dogmas i mean star trek into darkness it it's completely cheap they ripped off all these emotional things that are supposed to get trekkers excited and happy to see you and they and and they did that they relied on tropes and they relied on shop-worn um uh, cliches and they relied on stuff that had worked before in a different context and threw it all together and thought this will be work this will work and they ins- what they ended up doing was insulting everybody's intelligence and pissing off the true fans and making a lackluster movie at best um, they somewhat redeemed themselves with the third movie um, beyond um, but I, I don't want to go off on track but I think that is where Walking Dead's going mm-hmm. um, and by the way if you've not read up Google this. Frank Darabont, who did, who directed the Shawshank Redemption and I think uh, Stephen King's The Mist and some other stuff, and he's just a brilliant uh, director and a great writer himself. You know, he's the one who 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 converted. You know, he 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 was the showrunner on Walking Dead. He's the one who made The Walking Dead a TV show, and you should see. Go read the lawsuit information. It's all online. They fired. You know, AMC basically f- pushed him out. And for really crappy reasons, and a lot of the cast absolutely, you know, were ready to walk, and all this stuff happened, and it's pretty interesting. You can kind of see how TV is made because they talk about how the AMC suits would fly down to Georgia, where all the actors are like nearly dying from 110 degree heat. They the suits would go stand around in the air conditioned tent for 30 minutes, and then act as if they'd looked at things and left, and they they basically pushed Darabont out. So it's really interesting to see how the uh, sausage is made i i think some people don't like that because it takes away from the show when they know that kind of thing but um as a writer and as a creator um i saw darabont on el rey network with uh, uh director robert rodriguez talking about his career and they touched a little bit on the walking dead but they couldn't talk much because clearly there's a lawsuit going on and i thought ooh there's some meat there's some meat in there i want to get to it's uh, in the marrow of that bone and so i went and googled it up and there's some Interesting stuff. Were you familiar with that, Jason? 
A, a bit. Um, can you imagine, just as a tangent, can you imagine Frank Darabont if he had the budget on The Walking Dead that they now have, like Scott Gimple and those guys that are doing it now, if Frank Darabont wouldn't have been tossed and he now had the budget and the popularity with with the Frank Darabont brand of story focus? Oh, yeah. As If he would have been allowed to continue with the kind of dollars they have now, I can only imagine how amazing the but, show would be. But Jason, you know what the you know what this gets down to though? One reason Darabont got crossways with him, they were a runaway hit the first season, right? Runaway. Yeah. Biggest hit well, AMC ever had. They such w- a good show. Right. Yeah. And they went AMC went in and said, Runaway hit, thanks, great. We're gonna cut your show per show budget by a quarter and also the thirty percent uh, tax uh, bonus we get from the state of Georgia, we're just gonna pocket that. So you're gonna have to do more with less, even though you're a number one runaway hit. Yeah. And I, I know that. And was it season two with the farm, the infamous Herschel farm? Yeah. Um, I thought there was a lot of good stuff there. Yeah. And the audience just kind of fell off because it moved slower. Right. And and they didn't have all the zombie blood and guts because they couldn't afford it. But I thought that Darabont and his team of writers did really good work with those cuts. Yeah. I think it's a testament to, to their storytelling ability that they could salvage after all of those cuts. I I couldn't agree more. It, mm-hmm. it, you know, uh, <laughs> I have joked a, min- a million times. If somebody wanted to buy the John Pilot mystery series, they'd get it really cheap. And if they wanted to make a show out of it and wanted me on board, I you know, I've joked and said, shit, I don't care if they wanted John to shave his legs, wear high heels, and, you know, uh, sniff coke every other minute. I mean, I'll do it. I don't care because I would love to make, make a living off of my creation but the but you know that's really not true i mean i don't think i don't know could they put con in it and they could put con in it that would they be, could that would could be, they have i let scream con oh my god instead of the villain Derek crawl we'll just make him con there you yeah, go that yeah. that's brilliant by the way that's not pandering to the audience at all at all but you know that's funny because uh of course he's the her career stephen king is worth half a billion dollars there, people have said to him many times, "Don't you hate what?" Like, remember Under the Dome, which I called Under the Dome. I was, I thought a terrible TV adaptation of his book Under the Dome, uh, just awful, cheap writing. Anyway, they ask him because he was, I think, a producer on it anyway. And they ask him, "How can you stand what they're doing to your work?" And he just laughed and goes, "This doesn't change my work. My book doesn't change because of what they do on TV." He's like, "Man, cash the check." <laughs> See, and I, I would beg to differ with you on the only the first season of Under the Dome. I thought the first season was good. It became a runaway hit, and they turned what should have been a miniseries with a closed ending yes. into an ongoing series, and they completely spat in the face of everything they had written in that first season Fair in enough. the final episode. And it was like, are you kidding me? So the almighty dollar comes knocking, and you just, you just completely shit all over the integrity of your story. Uh, yeah, and they no, did. Yeah. And, and they would probably say, "Yeah, we did." <laughs> oh yeah, I'm with you. And that's and that's TV. But here we are complaining. But of course, you and I would, I dare say, line up if Canadian TV called you or American TV called you or vice versa for me. Both of us, both anyway. I don't care what TV. I don't. If, we would have we would have those meetings. For we, sure would, we would. Uh, but we, yeah. But Gosh. we would probably. I would bet. I would bet a lot of money that we would probably walk out of those meetings frustrated we'd probably be we'd we'd continue down that path and see where it went but i bet you we would both be appalled at suggestions and changes and and what they wanted to do to your creation you're you're right i think you're right but i would definitely still cash the check we want to give john pilot a sidekick we want him to be a small asian boy named short round (laughs) he's gonna have (laughs) one-liners mr pilot mr pilot (laughs) And we were thinking, Mr. McIntyre, just just not just think about it, all right? We were wondering if we could call it Dovetail Cave. Now, stay with me here. Stay with me. Everything will take place in this cave, all right? And there'll be doves, but they're going to be in the background. <laughs> go with it. Can you go with that? And by the way, we see that, uh, we see that uh, Martha Plimpton would be a really good lead for this. Yeah, it's it, it, yeah. I can see the whole thing. It would just really, but I oh, think that's, that's gold. That that experience alone, though, just to write about that would be fun. Just what happened, you know, what happened to my work when CBS bought it, you know, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, 
Yeah. And speaking of Star Trek, real quick before we go, because we wow, we we've already blazed through an hour here. Uh, is like the Star Trek uh, Discover Discovery, the new one. They keep pushing that show back, pushing that show back. They haven't got a cast. They haven't got anything. To, uh, the showrunners quit. All this stuff. You can just see how when people who <sighs> here's the thing: when people who are not creative do not create these worlds get involved. Now, I understand. You've got to have a budget, and you've got to have people who, who will hold your feet to the fire to stick to a budget. Fair enough. But you, there are so many. Kolchak's a Night Stalker back in the 70s. When you see so many of these really great ideas, they get absolutely screwed because the suits get involved. It makes it so difficult um, to maintain any kind of quality or integrity whatsoever um, in certain situations. That's why the whole... Um, concept of you know uh, cable tv getting into producing shows because they generally the idea at least when it started if you think about it was the suits stay out of it but amc Mm -hmm. but amc no if you read up on that amc got involved um Mm -hmm. and one of the comments made i'm paraphrasing was that they were small time executives who didn't really understand what they had and they and they blew it in a lot of ways so Jason, final thoughts before we wrap this this Thanksgiving bonanza, this incredible buffet of turkey. Uh, anything else before we wrap it up? I, I seriously think you should consider the the pilots caffeinated versions uh-huh. uh, yeah. for the future, just to keep because I know there's a rabid fan base yeah. mm-hmm. um, of pilot fans yeah. that need pilots rose and the the next book and the book after that, and I I know that. Indie readers, uh, pardon me, indie writers, um, they often have a mixed bag of things going on. They have full plates. They have families. They have lives. They have jobs. They have other things. I think that a daily or a weekly word count, I think I've, I've gotten some flack from other writers about about this idea of sitting down to business every morning or every afternoon or every evening and, and hammering out words, whether they be good, bad, or indifferent. I've gotten flack for that because some writers think, well, it doesn't matter how many words you write. It's, it's about quality. But I think having a regiment, I think, I think is going to net the indie, the indie writer out there who's listening to this, who's maybe on the fence about publishing work or finishing their first book. I think getting some sort of regiment is going to help them. And I, I'm not saying this to be, high and mighty or anything that I'm, you know, any great superstar or anything like you've that. Only, I just, you've only written 15 books. So what do you know? I just, I've found that, that having a regimen of some kind helps me get to that place where I have a finished piece of work, whether, whether you love it, whether you hate it, whether you don't care about it for my self satisfaction of finishing and completing and, and putting out work that I feel is good and shareable. I think, uh, I think that's my, my tip for anybody listening today is Whatever that measure is for you, measure it somehow. Measure your output somehow, and then you can you can go back and fix it in post production. You know that's what they do for for television and movies. We fix it in post. No, I you're you're hundred percent right. Stephen King advocates this. He t- he says you know create you know a thousand words fine. You can write every day except Christmas. You know that's what he tells people. Sure. Um, my grandpa who. I've talked about many times, Robert E. Trevathan, 30 plus books he pub- got published and by big publishers over, for over a 50 year career. Every morning, 4.30 a.m., he got up, set a kitchen timer for an hour. He, he didn't write a word count. He wrote for an hour. When that bell danged, he got up, went to the racquetball court, then he showered, then he got dressed, then he went to his job, came home that night, read what he wrote the night, uh, the morning that morning, made a few line edits. Next morning, got up, started all over again. Never missed a day. See, and that's that's exactly what I mean. It doesn't have to be 2,000 words. I think Stephen King says 10 pages, which is about 2,000 words. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's Stephen King. He 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 worked that up over thirty or forty. Is it forty years of he's, his career? He's, he's been writing for fifty years. Absolutely. Um, and your grandpa, he had his hour. Whatever your measure is, I don't even care if it's fifteen minutes. I think I think when you're drafting something, I think it's the best piece of advice that I've ever followed. Right. Is to do that daily or or even every couple of days thing to keep it fresh and keep it going. Keep that locomotive. J- Jason, you've inspired me. Now I'll tell you real quick. We keep, see, this is the problem with you and me. We just we keep going. Yeah. But you know that I, you know this about me that I work out six days a week. And yep. I literally put 
it on my calendar. It's it's an appointment for myself, and mm -hmm. and the results are tremendous for me in a lot of ways. What I need to do now is start booking minimum five days a week, maybe six. I can't say seven, uh, but maybe six days a week. I need to book an hour for writing, just like my grandpa did, and just absolutely make, make it happen. Yep. Yep. So one hour, one hour a day, basically. Okay, so six days a week. I, I get one day to do just nothing. But six days a week, I have to work out for an hour and I have to write for an hour. So there's two hours of my day that are gone, and two two things that will that are investments that are important. So I like that, and that is going to be, you know, here we go with the New Year's resolutions. But that is what I'm going to do. <laughs> my 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 goal. I I will be honest. The, the pilot's rose is going to be fits and spurts, just fitting it in as I can. But I'm. Uh, also, I've got some good advice from a friend uh, who says that maybe after Pilot's Rose, I take a break from Pilot and do some other stuff, and, and he's right. So we're going to think about that. Jason McIntyre, where do we find you um, if we want to buy your work and read your thoughts and et cetera, et cetera? Well, Google is always your friend. I mean, here's the thing. We could throw out a million website URLs and addresses and, and that kind of thing, but if you Google Jason McIntyre, you can find my books. If you don't want to do that, you can go to www.thefarthestreaches.com and you can get links to every place on the planet that has a book or has had me for an interview or a podcast or even had my spinach dip recipe. Mm. That's basically, that's the I call it the mothership, but that's where everything kind of starts from if right. somebody wants to go there. And my mothership is pilotscross.com. I'm on Twitter at A underscore Greenwood. You can track me down there. Don't forget, if you want to enter to win... A autographed copy of Pilot's Ghost, my third novel, my critically acclaimed third novel. All you got to do is write a starred review on Amazon, screenshot it, attach it to an email, subject line, my Amazon review, and send it to team at alexgpr.com. That's team, just like T-E-A-M, at alexgpr.com. First person to do that, don't forget to include your name and address and how you want it personalized, will get a copy of this book. Um... And do it fast, people, because you're competing with me. Yeah, and Jason's already got a head start, but he's promised to wait until this show actually comes out before he does it. Um, and the other thing, too, is... Uh, no such promise. Uh, well, I've... you actually, he didn't. Yeah, I'm just... <laughs> but I will say this. If if you send me a one-star review, you ain't getting the book. I'm just telling you that right now. If you think that's funny and you want to play a joke and say, ah, oh, there's a one-star review. Sorry, you're not getting a book for a one-star review. I don't see any reason to reward you for that because I haven't written any one-star books that I've published. So there you go. All right, this has been your Thanksgiving buffet. As I said, we are so thrilled. I Sorry if I got a little heavy at the beginning about the whole national election thing, but my views are heartfelt, and I, I'm, not, I'm sorry, not sorry, that I said it. Um, I think history will not be kind to a lot of people, um, particularly those who remain silent about this. Um, uh, more about that on another episode. Um, so until then, on behalf of Jason McIntyre, my dear friend, um, I'm J. Alexander Greenwood, and I just implore you this holiday season to take care of everybody you love, be kind to strangers, try to banish bad thoughts, and of course, above all other things, keep reading. Hey, how many people are you expecting? Relax, it's an open invite. I think you're a few seats short. Yeah, like four Team C. You should enter your eligible New York lottery draw game tickets with Collect and Win. You could win a $5,000 gift card to use at the Home Depot and buy a bigger table to host. Hopefully they also sell chairs. The Home Depot is not a sponsor of this promotion. You must be 18 years or older to purchase a lottery ticket. You must be 21 or older to purchase a quick draw ticket where alcoholic beverages are served. Please play responsibly. Enter by 1720. It's hosting season. And this hosting season... You can enter eligible New York Lottery draw game tickets with Collect and Win for a chance to win a $5,000 gift card to use at the Home Depot. So enter today and make one of the most stressful times of the year a little easier. The Home Depot is not a sponsor of this promotion. You must be 18 years or older to purchase a lottery ticket. You must be 21 or older to purchase a quick draw ticket where alcoholic beverages are served. Please play responsibly. Enter by 1720.